another week of Business Morning. Good morning and welcome to the program. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwabo. And I'm Ladi Williams. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's uh, take a look at what's in the news. OPEC and its allies have finally reached an agreement to gradually add more oil supplies to the market after Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates resolved their dispute. Uh, the group uh, agreed on Sunday to boot output by 400,000 barrels a day each month from August until all of its halted output has been revived. The deal will also give Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, Iraq, Kuwait, and Russia higher baselines against which their production cuts are measured from May 2022. The truth is expected to ease a looming supply squeeze and reduce the risk of an inflationary oil price spike. It also puts an end to a diplomatic spat that unnerved traders as the fight between the two long-time allies risks unraveling the broader accord between the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies that has underpinned the recovery in crude prices. Meanwhile, oil prices fell more than 1% this morning, hit by an agreement over the weekend within the OPEC Plus group of producers uh, to boost output after an earlier pact fell apart due to objections from the United uh, Arab Emirates. Brent crude was down $1 at uh, $72.59 a barrel after falling nearly 3% last week. U.S. oil was down $0.94 cents at $70.87 a barrel, having declined almost 4% last week. OPEC Plus ministers agreed on Sunday to increase oil supply from August to dampen prices that earlier this month climbed to the highest in around two and a half years as the global economy recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic. The group, which includes members of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and allies like Russia, together known as OPEC Plus, agreed new production shares from May 2022. Yeah, Jimmy, it'll be interesting to see how oil prices uh trend after well, this agreement. I, and I'm sure market is actually expecting this um, already. Exactly. See, last week we saw the uh, oil price trending downwards in anticipation of um, perhaps uh, this agreement. Exactly. And so now that they've agreed to increase their supply, of course, naturally we'll see the price, um, you know, trending downwards. But the question um, is how far, how far yes. that would go. Is and if the bullish I, I, run is I over, and of course, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Well, that. to our first uh, discussion today, we'll be discussing this uh, latest development in the oil market and what it means for inflation trajectory with uh, Mustafa Wahab, an oil and gas analyst at uh, Chapel Hill Denham. That's uh, next. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Okay, we now have uh, Mr. Mustafa Wahab join us now to look at those developments in the oil and in the global oil market. Thank you very much, Mr. Herr Wahab, for joining us on the program. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chimeze and Ladi. I'm happy to be with you. So morning. tell me, what do you make of this multifaceted agreement by OPEC Plus? Uh, was that in line with expectations? Uh, I mean, absolutely, right? The market has actually been waiting, you know, for... Uh, the cartel to actually agree you know on new production boosts right at least between august 2021 down to the rest of 2021 right if you recall i mean i think um, two weeks ago um, uae and saudi arabia was you know more or less in a political uh, battle you know to sort of you know decide whether or not they want to raise you know output for for uae i mean that's the, the, their baseline Right. I mean, at the end of the day, they were able to raise UAE's uh, production baseline from 3.2 million barrels per day you know, to 3.6 million barrels per day, which is quite short from what you know, UAE was actually accounting for, of around 3.8 million barrels per day. Right. So the impact of this, you know, this sort of agreement is, you know, probably was um, keeping oil price, you know, particularly stable um, as we currently speak. Although, you know, we've seen oil price, you know, shedding some sort of anywhere between 1% to 2%. Uh, from Friday till today, and that's basically because of the, you know, um, higher production um, uh, that is especially to be coming out from, from the uh, OPEC and its allies. I think they've now basically agreed that they're now going to be boosting production by around 400,000 barrels per day, right, between now um, and the rest, of, um, um, and the rest of the year up to April 2022. And obviously this agreement is still subject to a review on a monthly basis, depending on what you know, the dynamics of the market is concerned. But for us in Chapel Hill, uh, we think it's a positive de development, right? Uh, in our own point of view, uh, we think uh, this sort of output uh, boost would essentially help meet the um, significant um, increase in consumption that we've been seeing in the last, you know, couple of, couple of months. I mean, if you recall, um, vaccination campaign has quite, you know, been successful uh, globally. We've now started to see some sort of um, global macro, uh, macro landscape 
now gradually easing some sort of lockdowns that we've seen in the last couple of quarters. So the impact of this is supporting um, crude oil uh, consumption, and uh, we think that this this new development would obviously help keep the market in a balanced you know position. Okay. Uh, well. Well, it, what, what, I would like to also know what it would mean, you know, for the global uh, market, more importantly for Nigeria. Um, I think Nigeria basically hasn't really, really benefited from this sort of um, significant higher oil prices that we've been seeing. And I'll put numbers to it, right? So, largely, if you check in Q1, um, what we saw was that oil prices actually did roughly 31% higher, you know, compared to the previous quarter. And in the same period, you saw oil proceed for Nigeria declining by up to 23% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. I think um, oil produce is now down to $5.5 billion versus $6.1 billion that we saw in Q4 2020. And this is despite you know, this sort of higher oil price environment that we're in. And the reason for, uh, for this rapid deceleration in oil, oil um, export proceed for Nigeria is basically because of the fact that production for Nigeria is quite capped you know, to 1.5 million barrels per day. You know, versus our you know um, history of production of roughly two million barrels per day. You know, uh, uh, before the agreement was actually put in place. So, I mean, generally, we've not seen Nigeria um, 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 benefiting you know as much as we'd like to see. You know, be, uh, uh, um, which is mostly strictly coming from the you know production cap that we that we have. And I suspect this is essentially the reason why you know countries like UAE is also asking for a new. Uh, baseline for their competition of, 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 of um, their compliance, right? If Nigeria can also push this sort of agenda uh, where the OPEC, you know, and allies and its allies would essentially allow, you know, the country to raise its, its, its uh, production base, baseline, it then makes a lot of sense for us to see some sort of, you know, accretion to oil export proceed. But as far as we are concerned right now, you know, things are still not very rosy, despite the fact that we're in, the, uh, in, the, in the, an high oil price environment. Mm. Now, Saudi Energy Minister Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman says OPEC Plus is here to stay. Now, for you, do you think OPEC Plus is still relevant or do they have the capacity to keep the market balanced and, um, of course, obviously, oil prices? I mean, Chimeze, you would agree with me that, you know, the relevance of OPEC, you know, it, it can, cannot even be debated. Right. This time last year, when an environment where COVID outbreak you know, struck the global world, we saw consumption you know, decelerating significantly. And the impact of that you know, drove oil prices downward significantly. I think we were seeing oil prices trading at around $25 per barrel. And all of a sudden, we just saw the cartel and its ally you know, came into the market to agree that they want to cut output by 9.7 million barrels per day. And we started to see the impact of that, you know, essentially pushing, you know, oil price higher. And they've not, they've, I mean, they've been doing this in the last couple of years, right? You know, what they basically do is that to ensure, you know, markets continue to remain in balanced position, such that it sort of supports oil price at an elevated level, at the level where, you know, the cartel and its allies, you know, are well comfortable with, especially when, when it comes to, you know, fiscal position, right? Um, again, I mean, the latest, the latest stress to the cartel that we saw was the new tussle between Saudi Arabia and UAE, which a lot of markets was already writing the obituary of OPEC and its allies. And clearly, you know, over the weekend, what we saw was that they eventually agree on production costs, you know, to raise um, output by 400 barrels, 400,000 barrels by the, over the next couple of months, which basically shows that, you know, um, OPEC and its allies, they are, they are quite, quite, still, quite still relevant as far as global oil market is concerned. All right. Well, it, it actually hurts me that I missed that uh, twenty-five dollar uh, buy for oil at that time. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> a, a city group says uh, Iran is the wild card in the oil market. What impact do you think uh, Iran will have on oil prices? Um, Iran, Iran. Um, was it Iran now? Okay. Yeah. 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 So. Um, um, so the, the, key, the key concern really is for us in Chapui, we actually expected that, you know, resumption of um, significant oil production for Iran would probably, you know, undo some of the good works that we've done. You know, you recall that, you know, I think Iran is not, has not even been able to push beyond, you know, around 1.5 million barrels to 2 million barrels per day from the history of close to 6 million barrels per day that they've done before the, before the sanction that was imposed by the U.S. government. So what we're thinking now is that, I mean, what we've, we've started to see some sort of uh, gradual, you know, um, 
um, uh, success, you know, from talks between uh, uh, between Iran and, and the U.S. and it, it's already yielding some sort of fruit. What we think is that by the time you know Iran co comes back to the market, they could boost output by another two million barrels per day. I mean, which obviously for us in Chapel is another you know downside risk as far as oil, oil market is concerned. But I think the key question a lot of people are asking today is that whether or not. Um, OPEC and its allies will sort of include Iran to the new uh, production um, cut agreement. What we think is that it's very unlikely. I mean, uh, we checked, you know, fiscal position or external position for Iran in the last couple of, uh, in Q4 alone at least, what we saw was that the country is still in deficit of close to $4 billion, which basically means that, you know, currency inflation risk as, as well as the economic growth are still, you know, um, not, not very strong uh, for the country. So we think that um, the cartel will probably still exclude Iran from the production cost agreement and obviously allow the country to boost output so that it then supports its external position and obviously currency and, and perhaps as well um, inflation. Right. So recently we have seen global inflation rise, particularly in the U.S. and the U.K. So with oil prices trending downwards, as we have seen uh, this morning, what would that mean for global inflation trajectory? Is there any correlation between oil price and inflationary trajectory? Um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you check, you know, global, global environment, what you basically see is that, you know, crude, higher crude oil prices typically translate directly to higher, you know, PMS price products, you know, especially in the US, in the UK, and obviously all those, you know, Scandin Scandinavian, you know, countries, right? So um, I think, first of all, what you should, what you should put in mind, Chimese, is that uh, you all need to um, um, get used to higher oil price environment. I think this $70 per barrel levels is probably here to stay, and we'll probably see it, you know, being the, the new normal, at least in the next, you know, couple of months. So the impact of this is obviously going to, you know, continue to fuel inflationary environment, you know, for the, for the, um, uh, for, for the globe, right? So in terms of um, direct impact on Nigeria, I mean, obviously, uh, in, in, a, in an ideal environment, when inflation is rising significantly in the U.S., what you basically see is that, you know, Treasury yield, you know, would probably follow in tandem, you know, obviously move, move higher as well as, as well as inflation. And obviously you start to see the Fed, you know, also exhibiting some sort of hawkish rendition. So for us, as far as portfolio flow is concerned in Nigeria, this is quite negative. You know, once yield in the U.S. is starting to look attractive, you know, you start to see investors, you know, move away, you know, from emerging and frontier market down to developed markets where, you know, yield are a lot more attractive. And obviously, you know, risk are a, a, a lot lower compared to what you see in emerging and frontier markets. And obviously, you know, we're also in talks of whether or not Nigeria is going to um, do euro bond in the next couple of quarters, which obviously means that, um, Eurobond is basically priced, you know, uh, is basically benchmarked at, at um, the levels that was, uh, whatever levels we are seeing for, for the U.S., you know, Treasury yield, right? Once, you know, Treasury is starting to tick up, what that then means is that, you know, um, Eurobond is probably going to price a lot higher, you know, compared to, you know, the previous levels. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's by and large, it's not really positive as far as, you know, domestic um, impact is concerned for Nigeria. All right, but uh, talking about inflation, you know, here in Nigeria, headline inflation, core and uh, food inflation all declined, although, you know, marginally, according to the NBS uh, report released on Friday. But uh, anecdotal evidence suggests um, strongly that domestic commodity prices have increased by almost 33% between uh, the second quarter of 2020 and uh, 2021. For example, now, the, the price of bread one of the uh, commodities uh, uh, is uh, now 600 naira from 300 naira, you know, a year ago. So how can we justify the big difference between empirical data and uh, market reality? Um, so, Ladi, you are right, right? Um, and I'll just put number to what you just said. Uh, on a month-on-month -month basis, what you actually see is that inflation actually tick up slightly. And obviously, that's supporting the argument that, you know, food prices uh, domestically in Nigeria is still quite elevated. The only reason why you are seeing the headline of inflation trending downward is just basically on a year-on-year -year basis. And that's basically because of the fact that we are coming from an eye base effect. So it's purely eye base, not, not, necessarily, not necessarily because, you know, the structural environment in Nigeria is, is different from what we have last year, right? It's, it's just purely a base effect impact. Right. So, uh, again, to buttress your point, month-on-month -month inflation is quite elevated, and it was largely driven by, 
you know, uh, higher food prices, um, um, which obviously from, from cereal, you know, vegetable prices, and obviously uh, because of the fact that we are now, you know, approaching um, um, Muslim festive period, which is the Ilaya period. And then the next key question becomes, um, what, where do we see inflation going forward, right? For us in Chapel Hill, what we think is that that year-on-year -year inflation is still probably going to continue to moderate. I think we're expecting inflation to touch around 17% uh, percent, um, in, in, in July 2021, and that's basically be, going to be driven by the high base impact from last year. But in month-on-month -month basis, what we think is that inflation is still going to remain largely elevated, obviously because of the fact that we now start to see this massive demand that typically comes with festive uh, for Muslim um, um, Eid, Eid, Eid al Kabir uh, period, which essentially is going to push you know, food prices higher for the month of July. Uh, beyond July, uh, what we think is that um, inflation will continue to moderate, obviously because of that you know, high base impact from last year, and obviously because of the fact that we're also assuming that there's not going to be any major, uh, major price shock as far as you know, PMS price is concerned, and obviously um, on energy prices. Mm. So uh, how do you see the Central Bank's uh, Monetary Policy Committee responding uh, to this inflationary trajectory we're seeing, and of course the developments in the oil market when they meet next week? Um, I mean, for us, really, what we think is that, um, I mean, the CBN at the start of this year had basically mentioned that um, they, ha they can't do much, you know, in, in, in curtailing the impact of inflation on Nigeria's economy. Obviously, because of the fact that the inflation trajectory that you are seeing today, they are basically structurally led inflation, not necessarily because of the fact that not necessarily monetary policy induced inflation. So what the CBN will basically um, focus on as far as we are concerned is to repair, you know, the current, current you know, um, gross FS liquidity that we're seeing in the market. I mean, if you check parallel market rates right now, I think we're roughly at around 505 Naira to a dollar, which basically means that um, uh, the CBN will basically uh, tend to focus on you know, repairing the current, current you know, um, gross FSC liquidity in the market. What that means is that um, that would induce the CBN to sort of uh, become a lot more hawkish compared to what we've seen in the last, in the last you know, couple of quarters, right? This doesn't necessarily mean that the CBN would high rates in the coming, coming uh, monetary policy sessions. What we think is that the CBN can employ the instrumentality of, of OMO you know, to essentially attract, you know, FPI back into, into the country, which essentially is going to help um, um, solve this, you know, gross FSC liquidity that we're seeing in Nigeria today. So what we're thinking in Chapel is that CBN will, will probably continue to uh, exhibit some sort of hawkish rendition to ensure that, you know, um, um, normalcy uh, is back um, to, to, to the FX market in Nigeria. All right. All right. We'll, we'll see how uh, uh, the CBN will go uh, next week, what decision they'll take. All right, uh, Mustafa Wahab, thank you so much uh, for your time on Business Morning. Mustafa Wahab is an oil and gas analyst at Chapel Hill, Denham. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you, Ladi. And Chimese. All right. After the break, uh, we look at the issue of uh, road infrastructure development and refurbishment investment to tax uh, the tax credit scheme. Uh, that's in a moment. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Welcome back. And the Federal Executive Council on Wednesday approved the award of a contract to uh, Dangote Industries for the construction of five roads totaling 274.9 uh, kilometers at the cost of 309.9 billion naira to be advanced to the company as tax credits. And this comes under the Road Infrastructure Development and uh, Refurbishment Investment uh, Tax Credit Scheme. For a better understanding of, of this, uh, its prospects and challenges, we're joined by a partner, Tax uh, Regulatory and People Services at KPMG Nigeria. That's uh, Jibola Olomola. Great to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good, good morning. Well, in, in a nutshell, what is this uh, road infrastructure development and refurbishment investment tax credit scheme uh, all about? Well, um, the, the scheme is a, you can describe it as uh, an instance of public-private partnership between the federal government of Nigeria and the private sector of Nigeria, by which the government leverages the uh, economies of scale, efficiencies, and contracting protocols of the private sector in developing critical infrastructure projects across the federation uh, in the instance of EO number seven of uh, uh, 2019, road infrastructure. 
But like the minister also said on Wednesday, the objective of the government is to use this scheme as a model for de delivering infrastructure across several touch points beyond roads. But the scheme is primarily concerned at this time with road infrastructure. Now, we understand that um, certain specific investors have been granted approval to develop road projects under the scheme. Now, is the scheme open or close-ended? And what are the eligibility criteria for participation in this scheme? Well, the scheme has been designed to be uh, open-ended in the sense that it is not limited to a number of companies only. And so if you look at the list that the Honorable Minister for Works and Housing, Babatunde uh, Raju Pachola, SAN, read out during his press briefing, there were quite a number of private companies that were included on his list. Some of them were publicly listed companies traded on stock exchange. Some of them were companies in the oil and gas industry. Some operate in consumer markets. And there were at least one bank that was listed in the scheme as well. That tells you that the scheme is open to participation uh, to companies across different sectors of the economy. And quite a number of companies have indicated interest in participating in the scheme. Obviously, to build a road project is a very expensive proposition. Um, the average cost to build a kilometer of roads in Nigeria is about a billion naira. So what that then means is that the kind of company that can participate in a scheme of this nature has got to be a company with a very big balance sheet so that you can actually have the financial wherewithal to undertake the civil engineering work that is required by the scheme. All right, another issue. So now the is only that... limiting factor really is your ability to finance the road. Okay. Another issue now is how are these uh, roads selected and can an investor execute any road uh, project in Nigeria? That, that's a very, very good question. And um, from what we have seen, there are two categories of roads that are being uh, built under this scheme. The first category is what has been determined by the government itself to be priority sector roads. So if you look at the executive order, the president has already listed some roads that the government considers to be priority roads. And they are inviting the private sector to adopt all or any of these roads. The second category of roads will be roads that the private sector participant itself considers to be of economic interest. In other words, a road that can be demonstrated to be able to unlock significant economic capital for Nigeria if it was to be refurbished. If the participants were to come up with such a road as one that it wants to adopt, then they've got to make an application to the management committee of the scheme for approval of that road, and then the president will approve the road if it fits the investment criteria that the government has stipulated. Once the minister and the president are aligned as to the adoption of these roads, then the president will approve the roads, and just like the minister announced on Wednesday, um, the roads will then be included in the scheme. So that's the way it goes. It could be a road that's been pre-listed by the government, or a road that a participant brings forward as one of the roads that he would like to be published. Now, in your opinion, what is the expected benefit of the scheme to the government and, of course, the economy in general? That's also a very good question. And um, the, the benefit really is in terms of infrastructure availability. Like you know, um, investors have choice in where to move their capital to. And one of the things that affect investor decision is your ability to leverage your supply chain. So if you have goods, for example, that are stuck at the ports and you cannot mobilize and move those goods across the country to the destination point, then obviously there will be great luck at the ports. So taking the Apapa to Urunshoki Road, for example, repairing that road creates a throughput for movement of goods across that corridor. And so in terms of the economic benefits is one, movement of goods and services across the country. Secondly, direct and indirect job creation. And as you can imagine, once you create jobs by um, employing people to work on road projects, factories can also open to maximum capacity, which means more employment. And the more there is employment, then there is also indirect benefits 
the provisions of service providers that attract that are attracted to those centers of economic activity. I'll give you a good illustration. If you're going to build a one kilometer road, the people who are working on those projects are going to have to eat at the very basic level, which means that there will be activities of food vendors. They're going to have to live somewhere during the construction period. That means that rental properties will also be motivated. Their children will go to schools. They will be able to pay school fees, which means that educational sectors will get impacted. And you can model the impact of this economic activity across so many touch points of direct and indirect benefits that you then see that the economy itself is the, is the beneficiary of the multiplier factors that this activity can generate. So, so basically, it's a, it's a ripple effect. But what are the likely benefits of the scheme to the participants? And you know, how are these participants going to uh, recover their costs? And I also want to know the risk here. Right. So uh, for most of the participants that have been identified uh, from what the government has announced and what the Honorable Minister also announced on Wednesday, a number of the um, participants are companies, manufacturing companies. For the manufacturing companies, they have a direct benefit in the sense that they are better able to maximize the production capacity of their, fa uh, of their um, factories and manufacturing outlets that are situated around that corridor. So for example, you can move your goods better. For the other group of companies that are not manufacturing companies, some of them will view this as their contribution to the robust development of Nigeria. So for a bank, for example, a bank is agnostic as to where the situation of the road might be. You may find that the bank is then stimulating economic activities in a particular state in the sense of also mobilizing capital and encouraging the activities that could indirectly lead to an increase in banking deposits and banking activity. So for some participants, there will be a direct benefit in terms of uh, uh, optimizing their own production operations. And for other participants, the benefit is a bit more indirect in the sense that they don't have a direct benefit of the activity that they are undertaking. In terms of the risk to the participant, the risk really is in terms of getting their money back. Because ultimately, everybody is, I mean, if you're, if you're financing the building of a road, which is really the responsibility of the government of the Federation, what you are then doing is that you are lending to the country. And ultimately, the risk is how long will it take for you to recover your money? Will, will you recover it over three years, four years, 10 years? And that's the only risk that this complete space really. Now, it has been noted by several observers that the scheme is a reinvention of the tax deduction scheme previously available for road and other infrastructure projects under the Companies Income Tax Act. Can you please provide some insight into the key differences uh, between this revised tax credit scheme and the tax deduction scheme under the previous administrations? That, that's a very good question, and um, it allows me to also clearly demonstrate the difference. So in the old scheme, the, um, what you could get was a deduction. You were allowed um, to recover your investment through an accelerated and updated capital allowance process. So you could get a deduction against your ultimate tax liability. If you then walk through the valuation of what a participant gets, what you get is, because it's a tax offset, you are only able to recover a maximum of 30% of your spend. So let me illustrate this very simply for you. If you spend a billion naira on one kilometer of roads, you are then able to charge that one billion naira to your tax computation as a shield against your ultimate tax liability. And because the tax rate is at 30%, you are technically only able to recover 30% of your investment. That is the reason why that scheme was not very successful. And you did not have any private sector organization that sought to benefit under that scheme. Because it, it does not make commercial sense for you to spend 1 billion naira and recover only 300 million naira. The current scheme has learned from the lessons of the previous scheme. And it allows participants to recover 100% of the 
of their project cost. So if you have spent one billion naira building a road, you are able to recover one billion naira. And because you have also suffered accretion of the of the opportunity cost of having your money available for your business for a period of time, there's also a one-time uplift, which is currently measured at the monetary policy rate plus two percent as a one-time benefit to participants under the scheme. What that then means is when you compare the two schemes, under the old moribund scheme, you only get 30% of your money back. Under the new scheme, you get 100% of your money back. And you can see the difference in the adoption rate. Under the old scheme, almost nobody was interested in the scheme. Under the new scheme, several companies have indicated interest in participating and helping, partnering with the government to move the needle on Nigeria's infrastructure development journey. So you can see that the success of the new scheme is determined by the ability of the private sector participants to recover the cost of their investment. Exactly. Profit is uh, important there. But uh, it was indicated in the order that the scheme is expected to last a period of 10 years. Uh, are there uh, grandfathering provisions for road projects that extend uh, beyond the 10-year period? Well, because the, scheme, the, the tax credits themselves will be available until utilized. So if you have accumulated tax credits during the lifespan of the scheme, those credits will be available to you until they are fully utilized, even if they're utilized after the scheme. But the question of 10 years is in terms of identification and adoption of roads to be constructed under the scheme. So once the scheme expires after 10 years, if it is not renewed by the government, then no further roads can be developed under the scheme after that period. But for roads already done, the scheme, the uh, executive order itself, includes grandfathering provisions that allow you to recover the investments that you have made that have been recognized by the government. As of that date, you can continue to recover them uh, even after the scheme has expired. But you will not be able to add new roads after that date. Yeah. All right, Our I, I, hope I, I... is that when the government looks at the way the scheme has worked, if the government feels that it has been a success story, the government may, one, extend the lifespan of the scheme beyond 10 years, or the government may, two, expand the coverage of the scheme beyond roads into other critical infrastructure that the government might want to leverage private sector capital to undertake. All right, Achibola, a quick one before we let you go. How are we sure that the value of the tax credit is not in excess of the project value? Where is the assurance that this cannot be abused in, in terms of the valuation and the tax credit? That's, that's an extremely important question, and I'm glad you raised it. Um, so, the, of course, we know that um, there is a tendency to inflate contracts in the public sector, and the government has already taken very robust steps in ensuring the valuation of contracts in the public sector. So you have organizations like the Bureau for Public Procurement that currently values every single contract before it is awarded by the federal government of Nigeria. Now, those protocols that apply to public sector procurement also apply to procurement under this scheme. So when a private participant comes up with its costing, of a road infrastructure project. They have got to submit that costing, their bill of quantities, everything about the road they want to construct, the design, everything will have to be approved by the Ministry for Works and Housing and also by the Bureau for Public Procurement, who will look at all the issues around their costing. In addition, the Minister for Finance, who is the chairman of the management committee of the scheme, um, they also look at all these protocols and ensure that due process has been followed. And if you look at the constituents of the management committee, it includes the ICRC, which is Infrastructure uh, Route for, uh, Concession Regulatory Unit for Concessions. It includes the BPP. It includes the DMO. So you find that all these agencies work in concert to ensure that due process has been followed, valuation is done properly, and there's a phrase in the executive order that says that the costing must be what is reasonable, exclusively and necessarily incurred for the purpose of that road project. All that is to ensure that the cost of the 
get is efficient. And a simple comparison will help you see if you look at the cost, the average cost of a kilometer of roads under this scheme, and the average cost of a kilometer of roads um, outside of this scheme, you will see that significant cost efficiencies are being leveraged by virtue of this scheme. And credit goes to the Minister for Finance, the Minister for Works and Housing, and the President of the Federation for enunciating such a scheme and bringing some of the benefits that have been harnessed over the last few years for the benefit of all Nigerians. All right. Uh, let's hope uh, all parties reap benefits from this uh, uh, scheme. I will have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time on Business Morning. Mr. Ajibola Olomola is the partner, Tax Regulatory and People Services, KPMG. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much for having me. All right, uh, it's a new week in the market. Uh, time for opening call now with Anieta. Anieta, what well, we saw mixed sentiment at the equities market. Uh, the NAR appreciated marginally at the NAFX rate while remaining constant at the uh, parallel uh, market. Let's uh, kick off from there. Good morning. Good morning, Laddie. Good morning. Yeah, just, just like you mentioned, it's um, uh, among the four markets, it's, 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 it's uh, mostly mixed sentiment all across. But we're not starting with the equities. On Mondays, we start with forex market and of course we had a 15.71 percent increase in the total volume of transactions there there you have it down there then of course the mixed sentiment was in between the fx spot the force market the futures and the derivatives market you can see the two up here positive and then the two down here negative so now it just shows you that the, the, there, was, there, there was more of um, optimism. It was, was, there was more of bullish sentiments at the uh, Forex market there in contrast to the last three sessions that we've been having. Then also, if you take a look at the total value of uh, transactions at the investors and exporters uh, FX market, it was also up 26.07% at 653.18 billion uh, uh, million, million dollars to be precise. Now, also at the NAFEX, the Naira gained, went up by 0.05% in contrast to what it traded uh, the previous week at 411 point, uh, 411 seven cobble. It's firmed to 410.28 uh, cobble. Then also at the BDC was unchanged. Take a look at the uh, F, uh, fixed income market. Not much of activity there. A total of 33.5 billion Naira was the total value of transactions there. Flip over to the Treasury bills market, not too much, just it's, it's more of quiet sentiment. It's been quiet for, for quite some time there. We've been thinking that maybe most likely this week we're going to see activity. But of course, with the holiday shortened week, I, I, I don't expect that to, to happen. Then also, when you take a look at the central bank's um, special bills, no activity, especially on that particular Paper there, 30th of August 2021. Nil, that's the what we were there. Then also for the OMO market, the open market operations, just one. Now, when you flip over to the equities market, of course, it has been in the red, and this is the second time. Um, uh, although, sorry, sorry for that mix up there. It was down by 0.12% uh, as, at the close of last week. Of course, it's in the red. Now, also, when you take a look at the sectoral performance, it's also mixed. Banking, banking sector, consumer goods were up. Insurance sector, oil and gas were down. Now, and then the industrial goods sector was unchanged. So also, when you take a look at the total volume of transactions there, it was in the green, but the value as well as the deals were down. But of course, now let's take a look at the other market, the smaller unlisted securities market. There we have it there. 0.12% is what, what, what we gained at that market. And of course, the total value of, uh, uh, um, the total value of transactions there was 246.38% uh, in contrast to what we had last week. And then, of course, that shows you that there's more of interest in the unlisted securities market, which is not too different from what we have at the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Of course, the Nigerian uh, Exchange Group was uh, among the top uh, five most traded securities on that small uh, unlisted securities market there, where we also had a total of um, 1.97 million uh, um, uh, 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 securities traded there at 37.9 million naira 
in 23 deals. So that just, just shows you that um, there's, there's, there's kind of a mix. But I, to, to bring us up to speed with what happened at the equities market, especially the unlisted securities market, let's talk to Rotimi Fakayejo, who is a stock trader at the uh, Nigerian Exchange Group. Thank you for joining us, uh, Rotimi. Good morning. Okay. Now, where do we start from? The equities market or the unlisted securities market? It was a negative uh, performance for the equities market, but at the unlisted securities market, we saw an uptrend, which it, 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 it sort of switched from what it used to be performing in the last couple of sessions. So can you uh, uh, enlighten us on that? I work for the uh, Nigerian Exchange Group as uh, trading activities for the week ended. Yeah, it ended um, uh, negative altogether, but at the same time, it spelled different things for different sectors. Like uh, we saw a rebound in the banking sector stocks, and that was quite a good leap for, uh, and a good hope for the market as well. Because we know that in terms of volume traded and, uh, at every transaction, the banking uh, sector stocks are always a trade blazer. And so maybe for us to have that in my, uh, at the close of the week for the banking sector stocks, I think it's quite a good one. So it may not really be anything to give a finality to uh, a conclusion in terms of uh, how the market trended generally. Because I believe strongly with what we have seen in the banking sector stock, and that will result uh, being expected this week for, mid for some of the major equities generally exchange. I think uh, definitely we're going to have a better good running, a better good week running. And uh, for the unlisted securities, uh, NESG, I think uh, we always have it here and there. We can compare it in terms of volume and value traded. So if at the end of last week it ended positive, it may not really be anything to compare with the Nigerian exchange group market. Okay, so, well, we have a holiday shortened week, uh, so we'll look out for what um, the markets will be saying as from Thursday and Friday, so just about three days of uh, trading. Thank you, uh, Rotimi Fakajo. Okay, so, Ladi, that's it. The markets? Uh, we have just, just, just two, the two, tomorrow is a public holiday as yeah. well as Wednesday, but I'll still give you some market information yeah. that I can uh, get, get on my fingertip. It's a, it's a short uh, trading week. Uh, let's uh, hope maybe it's uh, all green. Thank you so much, Aniete. All right, uh, we'll take a break now. We'll come back with an opening call to London. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Right, time to look at what's happening out there in the UK. Juliana, good morning. Good to see you this beautiful Monday morning. It's Freedom Day today. How freely are people moving today with concerns of rising COVID-19 and with Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the Chancellor and the Health Secretary self-isolating? Good morning, uh, Chimise. Uh, coming from you from a very sweltering London studio. We're actually going through a heat wave um, in London. And um, you know probably better than I do that the Brits do love good weather. So in the run-up to today, Freedom Day, July the 19th, um, British uh, beaches were absolutely jam-packed to uh, the rim. Um, I think for some, Freedom Day started a little bit um, earlier. But yes, um, today there are now no longer going to be any restrictions on the amount of people that can attend weddings, naming ceremonies, funerals, people can go to nightclubs. In fact, there were some nightclubs across um, England that were open at midnight in preparation. Lots of people uh, planning to go and club the night away um, today. But, of course, this comes with a massive, massive warning. First of all, pretty embarrassing warning um, came from the health secretary, Sajid Javid. He was the first of the most senior politicians in Britain to confirm that he tested positive for COVID-19. He has had two uh, vaccinations. However, he said he was having mild symptoms. Um, and then, because we're living in an era called pandemic at the moment, that's what the British tabloids have labelled it, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the Chancellor Rishi Shunak also said that they would be um, self-isolating. This has caused a massive backlash because at first, uh, Whitehall released a statement saying that the two gentlemen... Uh, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister would not be self-isolated and that they'd be taking part in this new scheme that they're hoping to roll out nationwide on the 16th of August, where if you have had two vaccines, 
even if you've been pinged, you don't have to self-isolate, you just have to take a daily test. That quickly uh, was scrapped and you turned because, of course, there was so much of a backlash. There's lots of components of this story, but so far, uh, celebrations appear to be pretty much muted. I think with 50,000 cases a day, potentially rising up to 200,000 a day, uh, Brits are pretty cautious at the moment. Mm. And how are the markets waking up to this day and uh, what does the rest of the week hold? Yeah, uh, not great. Uh, the FTSE um, is trading below the 7,000 points mark. First time it's traded below that mark in about three or four months. This is obviously all because of the Delta COVID variant. Um, not only are there a record rise in surges here in the UK, across the world we're seeing it, particularly in Asia. I believe Indonesia is seeing a surge that is, appears to be out of control. We also heard as well that a couple of the athletes preparing for the Tokyo Olympics um, have also tested positive for the Delta variant. Even when it comes to travel-related stocks, the fact that from today, Brits travelling to amber-listed countries who want to receive British holiday makers will not ha have to self-isolate on the way back. That wasn't enough to lift um, the travel and leisure stocks. BA owner IAG, their shares are down by about 4.5%. Uh, Whitbread, they're the owner of um, the popular uh, budget um, hotel premier in. Their stocks are down about 3.5%. On the lower indexes, the FTSE 250, we're also seeing budget airline EasyJet, their shares are down by about 4.5%. Carnival, the cruise operator, all down. The weather's shining, um, uh, but the markets are red, red, red at early trading. We'll see if that um, updates at intraday, Jimmy. Absolutely. We'll look forward to that um, update later in the day. Thank you, uh, Juliana. Thank you. How we look at the crypto market, well, laddie, that market has been annoyingly quiet these days. Boring, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, how it is in this market. You know, it's, it's boring when it's in a bear market, mm -hmm. uh, but we get all the attention when it's a bull market. So mm -hmm. uh, this is the time to, you know, plan your positions. Well, it's a, it's a red Monday. All the, all, all the uh, big altern in the red, Bitcoin is in the red, Ethereum. Uh, even a couple of stable coins are also in the red this morning. And also we have that, uh, uh, the market cap, the total market cap falling below the uh, $1.3 trillion uh, mark. Now at $1.27 trillion this morning, uh, down 2.70%. 24 hour volume traded in the total crypto market at 8 a.m., $48.36 billion. We see it's down 13%. Volume zapping all uh, through the counters. Bitcoin dominance, 47%. We see it inching up there. Uh, price of Bitcoin at uh, this morning was $31,791 uh, at 8 a.m. It's down by 0.47%. See the volume there. Usually we have about, by this time, we have this uh, 60 to uh, 30 uh, billion traded, but now we're having 17.74 billion. So you see the volume is actually reducing uh, drastically there. We see it uh, at the one hour chart. You see Bitcoin is resting on the uh, middle Bollinger Band volume is down there and the uh, MACD is still in bearish territory. It's uh, almost getting to oversold region at 40 points on the RSI. Uh, so uh, price of Ethereum now, the king of the alt is $1,905 down 3% uh, this morning. 24 hour volume traded $12.87 billion in Ethereum. Uh, top alt by market cap. You see Binance coin there, $301 uh, down 0.91%. Cardano is at $1.19, down 1.13%. Uh, the debate's there is if they're going to release their uh, smart contracts for Cardano. And uh, we have Dogecoin at $0.18, cents, uh, down 4%. Uh, Elon actually had some, uh, brought some attention to Doge uh, over the weekend, uh, putting the Dogecoin as his uh, display picture on his social media page. Yeah, that pumped up the price a bit, but uh, we see now, you know, one Bitcoin goes down, you see all the altcoins go down, and uh, Doge is the biggest loser this morning, uh, down 4.33%. XRP now, below the uh, 60 uh, cents range, it's at 58 cents, 0.42% uh, uh, down. Uh, let's bring in uh, Olumide Additional now to uh, bring us up speed. Hello, Olumide. Hello, Ladi. Good morning. Good, good morning. Great to have you, Olumide. Um, this market is definitely in bearish territory, but the question is, how do you stay profitable in a, in a bearish market? 
Yeah, um, usually when you have uh, choppy uh, price patterns, the best thing is not to get to expose. At the same time, you should uh, always look at your technical patterns. I'm talking about price action, knowing when to buy low and knowing when to uh, reduce that if you are going in and out of swing trading. But um, overall, it's most advisable to uh, use your exposure. The market is showing uh, good volatility in terms of the fact that um, if you look at what is really happening in the market right now, the DXY, that's the U.S. dollar strength, is gaining momentum. And you could see crude oil prices even losing as much as uh, $2 a barrel. So it's not just um, the crypto market. There are concerns that the market has to tighten uh, because um, inflation rate is already over off the roof. And you look at the United Kingdom, you look at the United States. So now bankers are looking at ways of tightening liquidity and also, um, COVID-19 is causing havoc in markets. We see the new uh, mutant strains disrupting financial markets. And that's why investors right now are putting their money in the safe, um, safe even currency. I'm talking about the U.S. dollar. So market, um, market pundits expect that um, Bitcoin might not be able to hold on to the $30,000 uh, $30, price support level. And if that happens... We could see uh, more downsides, but uh, still, most of these assets. I tell people that it's when you see drugs on the streets that's when um, wise investors come in and uh, time to pick in value um, crypto assets. So I think uh, most of these crypto assets would uh, suffer a lot of drawdowns. And mm. also look at what happens to PNB. The fact that they bond about 400 million worth of tokens. We expect price to rally high, but no impact. investors were not really moved about that. So right. that just tells you that the bearish sentiment is kind of very heavy right now. So mm. as advice investors, this is not the time to get too risky, um, cut your losses. And um, for those that have diamond hands, yeah, the market would at one point. Diamond hands. Okay. Yes, it's very <laughs> unlikely for it to yeah. All right. All right, Lumide. Thank you so much. Always great to have you. Thank you. So, Jimmy, I, I hope you have uh, diamond hands there, but yeah. Well, I, I hope so. I hope so. But I'm just wondering if we should just uh, call on Elon Musk to just perhaps make a positive comment well, to at least bring some kind of activity. Well, in that he market. did make a positive comment about uh, Doge over the weekend. Well, that but didn't we move see the that market didn't really much. hold water, yeah. So, uh, right now, it's uh, nobody has well, that much Well, just like Olumide said, I, I think a lot of investors are channeling their attention to safe haven assets. Safe haven assets, assets yes, now. exactly. Since we're seeing uh, global inflation, you know, rising. All right, that's it on the program for today. Thank you very much for being part of it. I'm Chimizi Obi Wagwan. Don't forget to join us by 1.30 this afternoon for Business Incorporated for more updates on developments in the world of business. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.